a swelling population, uh, it was a it would be a move toward national uh, to, to, to totalitarianism. That's similar to the criticism of uh, African dictators who uh, had take a very uh, so-called undeveloped country into the 20th, 20th and 21st century. And then uh, finally, the sixth reason was that it's the fault of Russia. Russia is just an oriental type country that can't be made into <coughs> democracy. So these were the reasons for it. And uh, uh, we'll pick it up when I finish uh, the lecture today. Okay, so uh, we're back to uh, our point of Frederick Engels, uh, who uh, stated that um, when you make a revolution, you don't know exactly what you're going to uh, get. Uh, it doesn't at least resemble the one they would have liked to make. And I think that was probably true of Stalin himself. Uh, and finally, with Bukharin, where they thought it would be very easy, uh, we'll introduce a planned economy, give some of uh, the recalcitrants uh, what for, and uh, that will be that. And uh, that didn't turn out to be true either. And we've taken Stalin now from uh, his beginnings as a, uh, a really an outlaw, Koba the outlaw in, uh, in the corpses. Uh, through to uh, his adventures in the uh, uh, in the revolution and the civil war, uh, to uh, on to uh, the struggle for power, uh, and then through the bloody purges and the uh, forced collectivization, and finally uh, through the victory in the Second World War. And now we're coming up to the war is over, and. Uh, Stalin has entered the stage of history and is now going to uh, leave an impact. Now, for most of us uh, who lived through the Second World War, uh, this history that I'll be going over today is almost uh, old hat. We've all lived through it, and I don't think um, there's anything startlingly new, although there may be some new, new twists on it for you all. But we've all, uh, those of us at my age and thereabouts, have lived through this Cold War period. But um, I want to take this, uh, take us through this period with a slightly different twist and ask you to take on, uh, if you can, the attitudes that might have existed in Moscow instead of the attitudes that we're familiar with that existed in Washington. Okay. Now, you recall that at the start of the revolution in 1917, I pointed out that uh, one of the concerns they had was that the revolution would be snuffed out by the capitalist world that they were overthrowing. And there was a lot of criticism of Lenin at the time that this was not the right time to, uh, to have a revolution. In fact, Zinoviev and Kamenev and even Stalin uh, resisted the so-called April thesis that Lenin brought with him when he, stopped, when he stepped off the chain, train at the Finland station. And so uh, this question of, of capitalist encirclement was a concern, uh, was a realistic concern during the Civil War, and it became a concern during the 20s, and even during the 30s as the Hitler uh, regime uh, took uh, momentum, and Stalin tried to play uh, the international game so that uh, Hitler would be engaged in a repeat of World War I in which Britain and France and Germany would uh, exhaust themselves in an unending uh, terrible war and uh, he would stand on the sidelines. As it did not turn out that way, uh, they were in dire a straits during the first year of the war as the Hitlerian army uh, rolled up to the gates of Moscow. And so when this war ends, when this war comes to a conclusion, we have a regime in Moscow that has the history I just quickly recounted. And what do they see around them? They begin to see a world in which Lenin's idea begins to have a kind of 
of completion. We begin to see not revolutions of the proletariat, but let's say imposed revolutions, socialist uh, governments imposed by the Red Army on the countries surrounding the Soviet Union. This is what they wanted in 1917. They wanted to ignite a revolution in, um, in the Europe. So now they have the results of a kind of revolution. The countries surrounding the Soviet Union are now going to be socialist, uh, however you want to uh, 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 describe that. And just think about those countries that surround them. I mean, we didn't see it that way. Washington didn't see it that way. They saw it that they're not letting these people have freedom. But from the Soviet point of view, Bulgaria was, uh, armies of Bulgaria were united with the Hitlerian armies and they were in the Soviet Union fighting them. The armies of Hungary were also in the Soviet Union and fight. The armies of Romania were also with the German army fighting the Soviet Union. So three of those countries which were suppressed and uh, made socialist, they had some reason to have uh, uh, thoughts about allowing them their quote-unquote freedom. Poland was an over uh, the uh, centuries uh, antagonist to uh, Russia and during the Civil War as, uh, as we uh, have already discussed Polish armies were in the Soviet Union so from their point of view there was reason to impose a socialist quote-unquote regime on Poland. And as far as Lit Latvia, Lithuania, or Estonia, these were all parts of the Russian Empire, which they felt belonged to them. I'm talking now about the point of view of the Soviet um, uh, leaders in Moscow, not only Stalin, but the other communists as well. And so when the war ended, if there were cries from the West about, look, you have to give these people a chance to choose their own government, there must have been guffaws and laughter about the idea that they would allow uh, this to happen. And that is the basis of the emerging Cold War. They were in no mood to allow the uh, West to tell them what should be done in these Eastern countries. And as we see, we go through this Cold War, and as it emerged, how I would say almost impossible it would have been for uh, the dreams we had of a world of cooperation uh, in the circumstances that evolved at the end of the war. And with the passing of the FDR and the coming onto the stage of uh, Truman, uh, there wasn't any chance any longer for this to happen. Uh, I'm not really want to criticize uh, Harry Truman too much, but he really wasn't in any mood to countenance this kind of, uh, of uh, world that uh, might have uh, emerged. Okay, so uh, FDR is gone, and they're going to be meeting in Potsdam. Potsdam is right outside of Berlin. And uh, Stalin is going to, uh, to visit Berlin. Now, this Stalin has not gone on any air travel. He had enough going to Tehran. He's going to go out there by train, okay? And there are going to be 62 uh, villas uh, prepared for the Soviet de uh, delegation in the village of Potsdam. Okay, seven regiments of uh, the NKVD are uh, mobilized, 1,500 troops and they're, they're deployed along the railroad track. About every half a mile, there's another soldier making sure that nobody is going to uh, interrupt the train and that Comrade Stalin will be safe. Uh, there's armor plating installed on the train. You can imagine how Stalin is concerned about what could happen. And you'll see in the next, in the next few slides that the concern is, is real. There is Certainly, uh, the war is over, but is it, all, is it completely over? It's hard for us to realize what was going on in the Soviet Union. Okay? Well, let's look at the, at the A-bomb before we get uh, over this. Uh, there was a laboratory set up in the Gulag.
okay? There were a thousand prisoners in the gulag working on the atomic bomb. Uh, there were 5,000 in the gulag working on the atomic bomb. Uh, they get the bomb by 1949, before Stalin dies. And the same year of his death, they get the hydrogen bomb. So our uh, American uh, monopoly on the bomb, American and British monopoly on the bomb, was very, very short-lived. And notice, too, uh, when uh, Truman tells Stalin that they have had, that we've successfully tested a bomb, he's telling somebody who knows very well that we have a bomb. He has had the spies, Klaus Fuchs and other spies, reporting into the Soviet Union about the work on the bomb. And for, uh, for Stalin, this is something that he expects. He expects the West, the Americans and the British, uh, to be deceitful just the way he is. Uh, it's very common, it's a human characteristic that you project on the other person your own uh, suspicions. And in this case, he felt it was uh, confirmed. Uh, the war is over. Uh, we have, look at the result of the war on the Soviet Union. The old 10 million is going to come back here. 10 million military killed and 10 million civilian killed. Every time something happens in the Soviet Union, it's not like our country where it's like digestible numbers. In this case, you can see where the 10 million exists again. The wreckage is, is uh, unimaginable. 70,000 villages, uh, factories are gone, railroads are, are all ripped up, the collective farms. 30% of the national wealth is gone. It's just horrendous. They are a total and complete wreck, although they have successfully defeated a uh, formidable enemy. Okay. Now, the war is over in 1945. And this is a slide telling us that in 1946, a year after the war is over, there are still partisans, 8,000 partisans. I mean, we're, we are concerned ourselves that our 4,000 soldiers have been killed in Iraq, and we're, we're eating our, our hearts out about it. But here we are in Russia with almost 10,000 partisans being killed a year after, quote unquote, the war is over. Okay, and uh, there's a hope now that there will be no more terror, that the 1930s are over, that the shortages will be over. And for us, who lived through the Second World War, we remember that once the war was over, the shortages for us were over and the war passed into history, and that we moved on to a new stage. However, that was not true in the Soviet Union. Reconstruction commenced in the same way it was as though the 30s were all started up again, and the same old routine and drumbeat began again in the Soviet Union. The Stalinist system back in its old uh, routine. So Stan, in, yeah. in 1946, you're saying in the Ukraine, they're still fighting against the Soviets. It's amazing. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. I never knew this. Yeah, yeah. they were still out there. There were still people who uh, thought that they could still break away. The Ukraine has, you know, even now, the Ukraine is, a spe is another country. The Ukraine was never felt themselves as part of uh, the Soviet system, of uh, Russia. And we had deportations. Beria was now in full charge of the uh, secret police. And uh, Ishtanov, who was uh, the party chief in Leningrad, now took over as the chief um, uh, intellectual of the party. And Stan, uh, as a matter of fact, Stalin arranged, he didn't arrange it, but uh, he encouraged uh, Svetlana to marry Ishtanov's uh, son. And uh, she did marry his son, and she lived with them. She couldn't stand the family. She uh, ended up uh, hating them, and she got divorced from uh, Shtanov's son. She has children, but I'm not sure if her children are from that family. I, I can't remember now. Uh, as far as uh, Svetlana's uh, background, during the war, just be 
yeah, just I think during the war, she fell in love with a, a movie director, a, a Jewish guy, and that was a bad move on his part because Stalin saw to it that he was thrown in jail and he was given a five-year sentence. Uh, he got out of jail, unfortunately, while Stalin was still alive, and he was arrested once more. Get, get it out, after surviving five years in the Stalin jail, he was arrested a second time. Uh, she never married the guy. He eventually, he survived it all, and he got out after Stalin's death. Uh, you see that they're still running after Trotskyites, they're running after Mensheviks, and they're running after the socialist revolution or the social revolutionaries. And whites, this is 1948, they're still looking for whites. Okay, now it's his 70th birthday. He's not going to live much more after this, okay? He's the generalissimo of the Soviet Union. Uh, he's suffering from uh, dizzy spells. Um, and uh, his health is going. And this is part of the things, I think, that were driving him uh, to the excesses that he exhibited. People are coming from all over the world, including Mao. We'll talk about Mao in a few minutes. Now in Poland, let's go over, now what I'm going to do is go over some of the various issues that occupy Stalin, particularly on the international scene, uh, between this point and his death. Okay, so in 1942, during the war, he's, he's demanding recognition of the Curzon line. Lord Curzon tried to mediate the war between the Poles and the young uh, Red government in 1920 and suggested a line uh, which was pretty much the old Tsarist Empire. Uh, the final line that was agreed at the Treaty of Riga at the end of the Polish-Soviet War was much to the west of this point. And uh, as you saw when I showed you those maps, Stalin successfully uh, at Yalta uh, negotiated the return of those lands uh, to the Soviet Union. And so in 42, at the, at the Tehran actually, he was advocating the Curzon line. In 43, the Germans uh, revealed that thousands and thousands of Polish uh, officers were found in the shallow graves in the Katyn forest. Uh, these were people who the Stalin uh, regime killed at, uh, during the uh, Polish-Soviet War. Uh, no, I had that wrong. They killed these people in 1939 when they're during the pact with uh, Germany. And there must have been about 15,000 young soldiers, uh, officers of the Polish army, who were murdered in the Kachin forest. Uh, the Brits had a uh, government, a Polish government in exile in London, and the uh, Soviets had one, which they established in the Polish city of Lublin. Uh, the one that they established in Lublin was subservient to the communist government, and that's the one that eventually was uh, in charge of Poland. Uh, there was a Polish uprising in Warsaw when the Red Army arrived, and I spoke about that. They halted and allowed the Germans to eliminate this uh, rising before they advanced into uh, Moscow. It was the opposite of the Polish uh, uh, war, uh, the Polish experience in 1920, when the Soviets came up to the gates of Warsaw and tried to get in, and the Poles barred them. In this case, the Soviets came up to the gates of Warsaw, and the Poles wanted them to come in, but the Soviets sat outside. <clears throat> it's, uh, this is an entire story of hatred between two peoples, what I, what I see from this. Now, in Czechoslovakia, uh, this is a quote, the first is a quote from uh, Benesh, who was the president of Czechoslovakia. Um, the, everywhere the Soviet Red Army went, uh, when, the, when the war was over, the result was a, uh, a, a communist or communist subservient government. And Benesh, who wanted a free Czechoslovakia, you remember the Czech brigade from the story of the Civil War? Well, here we have Czechoslovakia again in the story. Uh, 
they have to come to an agreement with Stalin because his armies are there. And they, uh, they suppress the independent, or what was then an independent government. In February 1948, 12 ministers resigned, mostly from the, so from the communist side, and a Soviet uh, vice foreign minister arrives in Czechoslovakia. Now, the Red Army is still there. Uh, Benish agrees to a government, when he says, quote unquote, without reactionaries, it means a uh, communist government. And uh, Jan Masaryk uh, is either thrown out or forced to jump out of a window and dies uh, below his office. And by 1948, which really was a terrible year for uh, Soviet-West uh, relationships, a single list election is current and Czechoslovakia becomes a communist country. Uh, I'm going to be talking about this. I had a video to show you something about uh, a trip Sandra and I made about two years ago to Eastern Europe. It was Berlin, uh, Prague, uh, Berlin, Prague, Vienna, Budapest. And when we were in Prague, I visited a museum called the Museum of Communism, which uh, had the exhibits about the communist uh, uh, life at the time. There's a great deal of resentment against the, uh, this regime and, uh, and what was imposed on, the, on these people. The same is true in Hungary. I'll talk about that uh, when I get to it. Now, Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was the only country where a communist regime, well, at this point, uh, China is another example, where there was no Red Army. The Red Army did not impose communism on Yugoslavia. They had their own uh, partisans uh, who uh, resisted uh, the uh, German occupation and were greatly uh, aided by Britain. Britain aided the Yugoslavs, and if you might recall, in 1944, when Churchill visited uh, with Stalin and drew up that uh, uh, percentage uh, agreement, Yugoslavia was supposed to be 50-50, 50% for uh, Russia and 50% for the West. But it didn't turn out that way. Uh, actually, it turned out that Tito became an independent operator, more alive with the third world. We'll talk about that in a minute. But in 1944, this is what Stalin tells uh, Tito. Uh, bring back the king. Listen to this. Bring back the king. Take him back temporarily. And then he goes on to say this. And then you can slip a knife in his back at the suitable moment. OK? And, and this is in, in, uh, in a memoir by uh, De Gilles about uh, where Stalin, well, we're, we, we're all not surprised by this kind of thing. But Stan, Tito's operating under the protection of England. What, and what, what was the form of that protection? Well, uh, no, I, England, what England, the, the form of protection wasn't protection. During the fight against the, so, uh, against the German occupation, the source for arms and for supplies were parachute droppings from British airplanes that would fly over Yugoslavia and supply uh, Tito and keep him going. Uh, Stalin was in no position to help him out at okay. this point. So uh, Tito was up in the mountains uh, in Yugoslavia, and the Brits were supplying him. You could also bring the destroyer in or a small craft in along the shore over there and get in to help him. So all the help that he was getting was coming in from Britain during, during, period, during the war. During that period, right. Uh, now, in 1948, at almost at the same time that this is going on in Czechoslovakia, there was a lot going on in this period of time. Uh, Tito reaches out to Bulgaria and proposes a Balkan federation. Now, what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this is that Tito didn't ask Stalin's permission. He just went out on his own sending a note to the Bulgarians. And the Bulgarians, of course, turned around and asked Stalin if it was OK, although one of the Bulgarians who got involved with this is later executed. And this scared Stalin, and so he turned on, on uh, Tito. Because you can't do this unless you ask me. You know, 
It was okay for Stalin to be, it wasn't okay, but from his point of view, it was okay. He's, he's uh, purging the Soviet Communist Party, and he has total control over them. But now he's the leader of an array of governments, and he wants the same control over them. But they're not so easy to control. In a way, Stalin was lucky that he didn't go all the way to the English Channel and try to impose a Soviet government on France or on Germany, because he would have had his hands full in spades had he done that, as Khrushchev had uh, later on after Stalin's death. Okay, so in, four, in June, Yugoslavia doesn't attend the Communist Forum meeting, and they try to pull a coup d'etat on, on uh, Tito, and it fails in 1948. And now Tito is going to replace Trotsky as the enemy of Stalin. And every time Stalin purges, he's going to accuse the, uh, the people that he purges not of being Trotskyites, but of being Titoists. Okay? And now Yugoslavia is expelled from the communist form. Now you remember, I told you at the beginning, that, that when they took out the desk of Stalin, there were three letters. One from Lenin, which you saw, was his testament. And the letter that he sent uh, having to do with uh, how Krupskaya was treated. The second was the note from Bukharin, who said, Koba, why do you need my death? And the third, I said, was from Tito. And this is what Tito sent him. Stalin, a telegram. Stop sending people to kill me. We've already captured five of them, one with a bomb and another with a rifle. If you don't stop sending killers, I'll send one to Moscow, and I won't have to send a second. Now, can you imagine leaders of countries sending notes like that to each other? It's unbelievable. But with Stalin, of course, it's believable. And the thing that's weird about it, or not so weird, is that he keeps it in his desk, and it's there the day he dies. It's, it's wild. Okay, now, in Germany, there's... Um, a solution to the 30% of the Soviet wealth that's been consumed. What's the solution? The solution is reparations. Okay? And they do. They go into Germany and they take out factories. They're, they're expert at, at dismantling and moving factories because they had to do it during the uh, German invasion as they moved their own factories beyond the Urals. So they knew very well how to do this. They have to rebuild the Soviet economy. And they actually show an interest in the Marshall Plan. They attend the first meetings of the uh, uh, Europeans who are going to apply for Marshall Plan aid. But the West tells them, if you're going to have our aid, we want to know all your plans, and we want to participate with all the plans. And that's just not going to happen under uh, the Stalin regime. The West unified their occupation zones because when Germany was defeated, there was the French, the British, the American, and the Soviet zone. And the three zones, French, British, and American, are unified, and Stalin is deathly afraid of another war with Germany. And German rearmament is anathema to him, and he wants to do everything possible to stop German, Germany from getting rearmed. And that was the basis of the June 24th, 1948 Berlin blockade, to pressure them to stop any possibility of German rearmament. That was what was behind most of it. And here's the answer to the blockade. You all remember this picture, the airplanes coming in to uh, Berlin to supply them from the west instead of sending the trucks in. Okay. Now, the blockade is finally lifted a year later, or less than a year later. The Federal Republic of Germany is installed, and in continents of that, in May 49, the Federal Republic is, is installed, and a year and a half later, the Germans, uh, the Soviets, install the German Democratic Republic, or East Germany. 
<clears throat> and so we have a split between the two Germanys. What do you think this looks like to you? Is this, what does this remind you of? Anybody out there, up there, Peacefield, uh, Pittsfield? What does it look like? Looks like Hitler Youth to me. Brown shirts. What it looks like brown shirts. You know what it is? It's East Germans. That's youth in East Germany. They look just like the Nazis. Okay, now, in 1952, Stalin calls for free elections throughout Germany. Free elections throughout Germany. And he was asking, in a sense, for a reunification of Germany. And my question is, do you think he meant it? I think he meant it if it meant uh, neutralizing Germany, if it meant some kind of guarantee that Germany could not be rearmed. Now in Israel, take up this question. Uh, FDR raised this question uh, with uh, Stalin at Yalta, and he asked him if he was pro-Zionist, in which uh, you got this answer from Stalin, yes, in principle. Uh, from Stalin's point of view, the fight for uh, uh, the uh, Israel uh, independence looked to them like a dismantling of the British Empire. And so they were in favor of it, because it looked to them like it was against Britain. And so they uh, sanctioned the flow of Czech armaments into Israel during the fight for independence, which was a crucial pipeline for uh, the uh, uh, fighters for uh, Israel's uh, uh, existence at the time. Most of the arms that they used <coughs> were coming through from the Czechs. Uh, one of the leaders of the Czech uh, Communist Party, the General Secretary of the Communist Party at that time, was uh, Rudolf Slansky. And Slansky would pay with his life for this uh, uh, action. Uh, in 1948, Golda Meir uh, visits Moscow. And she goes uh, to a Moscow synagogue. She gets a tremendous welcome, which disturbs Stalin profoundly. He doesn't like this kind of thing. He doesn't like to see any group inside Russia show a nationalist bent like the type of, of, uh, uh, of demonstration that appeared here. And he's particularly suspicious of Jews. He's had experience with Jews. He's had his three main enemies in the struggle for power being Jews, and there have been plenty of Jews in the Soviet Communist Party that he's been antagonistic to. Shortly after that, the anti-fascist committee is disbanded, the Soviet Jewish anti-fascist committee, and Solomon Mikols, who was the chairman, is killed in a traffic accident. This, is, this killing in a traffic accident is not the first assassination that's been carried out under this kind of uh, procedure. And he begins an anti-Jewish campaign, which exists up until his death in 1953. <clears throat> um, in 51, they begin to cut off the pipeline from Czechoslovakia. And in 52, relations are severed, because now he decides that there's no longer any uh, percentage in siding with Israel. He's now going to be siding with the, uh, with the um, Arab nations. And here's a picture on the uh, left is um, Gutwald, who was the uh, uh, president of the communist regime in Czechoslovakia. And on the right is uh, Rudolf Slansky. Slansky will soon be purged and then executed as a uh, Titoist. Being a Titoist is, new, is the new uh, a bad guy. Look how they're, yeah, they're, they're friends with each other there. OK, now let's look at China. In 1945, the uh, Soviets pull out of, uh, out of China as the war is over. OK? Uh, what is Stalin's position on the uh, relationship between Chang and Mao. This has been a complicated relationship. Um, 
Stalin doesn't have much confidence in the ability of the uh, uh, Mao forces to overcome Chiang. He wants to play both sides. Okay, so he doesn't really um, satisfy Mao completely. He advises Mao to get along with uh, uh, with uh, Chiang, and he actually signs a treaty in 1945 with Chiang. And in the treaty, uh, he gains control of Port Arthur, he gains control of Darien, and he also can train uh, gains control of the Manchurian Railroad. The Manchurian Railroad is more than a railroad. It's an actual monopoly industry that has many, many economic uh, 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 features and, uh, and possessions. So he's actually controlling Manchuria from all of this. But Chang is getting recognition, and Mao is getting, as we say in Yiddish, bupkis. Okay, so Mao begins to grow during this time, and he's not totally defeated by Chiang. He's up there in the northwest, and he's now got about 200,000 forces. Now, Chiang looks, to some people, he looks strong. I don't know exactly what the, what the Americans felt about him. I know if you want to read about Chiang, a very interesting book, read the, the Stillwell Diaries. Uh, Vinegar Joe, Joseph Stilwell, was a general in Burma, and uh, he had kept diaries about his, uh, his conditions. He calls uh, Chang Pithead. He hated Chang because of the corruption and the uh, dishonesty of uh, Chiang Kai-shek. It's a very interesting analysis uh, and also an interesting story of that part of World War II. Uh, so Chang is uh, full of corruption. Uh, he's really very uh, weak, but uh, Mao's forces are growing. Uh, there is a delay uh, in um, uh, when Mao finally defeats uh, Chang in their uh, struggle. Uh, the USSR is not recognizing Mao right away. Mao travels to Moscow. Now, the defeat of Chang Chang pulls out and goes to Formosa, now known as Taiwan. Then it was called Formosa. And uh, that occurs in November, late November 1949. Shortly thereafter, after defeating Chang, after having all of this struggle, Mao leaves his own country, where he's needed, undoubtedly, and travels to Moscow. And he doesn't go back to China until February 1950. So he's in Moscow all through December and all through January. This is, a, it's very surprising that a leader will stay away that long at a critical junction, and he wanted something from Stalin, which he wasn't getting right away. Two months, no reception. Stalin does not come to the train to meet him. He, uh, Mao spent weeks on the Trans-Siberian Railroad getting over to Moscow. He sends Molotov to meet him at the station. When Ribbentrop arrived in Moscow for the German-Soviet uh, treaty, Stalin went down to the station to, be, to meet Ribbentrop. Now here comes Mao. He doesn't, he has, there are other things that insult Mao. And this is what Mao said. I only had three tasks, to eat, to, s to sleep and to shit. In other words, what he's saying, I'm here, and what am I doing? That's all I'm doing. That's really bad. Finally, they sign a treaty, and he was pushing him. Mao was insisting that he get certain things, and what he got was the railroad back. It's not just the railroad, as I said. It's all of the... Uh, of the ownership that the railroad implied, and an obligation to stand against America should America invade China. And that's what he was after. Mao was also afraid of encirclement. And here they are. Now what's interesting about the picture is the lack of smiles. <laughs> Well, Russia couldn't get much out of it. Russia had to give up things. Russia had to recognize that this was a so, this was a communist country, and this was not easy for Stalin. This was something that they really 
were concerned about it. As you know from history, as it went forward, there was antagonism finally, even during the, uh, certainly during the Khrushchev years. Speaking of Khrushchev, there he is. I can't see, where is, oh, there he is, all the way on the right, yeah, right. <clears throat> okay, now we get to Korea. Now, the Soviet Union was uh, the next best alternative for, uh, for the Koreans. They were, uh, the, the, the Chinese were not helping them. And the, um, the Koreans, the U.S. Uh, US uh, came uh, running into Korea uh, to prevent, because the Soviets had, were coming down from the north. You know, uh, at, uh, at Potsdam, one of the uh, aims that Truman had was to get the Soviets to finally get into the war. You think about which, where uh, this all was going with Japan and China. The Germans were dying to get the Japanese into the war against the Russians. The Americans were dying to get the Soviets into the war against the Japanese. And we weren't sure how well the atomic bomb was going to work, so we wanted the Soviets to get into the war. They get into the war 10 days before the end of the war. And one of the things they do as quickly as possible is come down the Korean Peninsula. And one of the things we do as quickly as possible is come in up the Korean Peninsula. Okay. And this is a comment uh, from Stalin to Mao, you take responsibility in the East, we will divide up the world. Kim Il-sung, the uh, head of the Korean uh, communists, was trained and fought. He actually fought with the Chinese communists. Okay, he was trained by the Russians. Now, he repeatedly asked after the war to sanction a military move and take over the rest of the peninsula. At the same time he was doing that, Sigmund Rhee, who was the head of the uh, South Korean government, was doing the same thing in Washington, and we were resisting him. Kim gets an actual okay from the Russians. He visits Stalin. Stalin is worried about it. Will the United States get, if you get kicked in the teeth, I shall not lift a finger. And as you know, there was a finger lift. The uh, Soviet uh, uh, MiGs were, uh, were flown in defense of the uh, uh, North Koreans. But the army, it was reserved for Mao to come in with his army in the Korean War. Kim goes to visit Mao. And uh, Mao asked him if he, wants to if he wants his troops. And Kim says no. And in uh, 1950, the CIA says an assault was contemplated but called off. But as we all know, the war proceeded to the point up to the Yalu River. We all recall what had happened. The USSR boycotts the Security Council. That was a, a, a strategic error because and in their boycott of the Security Council, uh, a proposal came up to support the war uh, on the side of the South Koreans. Okay? There'll be no need to invoke. Better to have a UN action because this treaty that Mao got in 1949 said the Soviets would come in if America engaged in a fight with uh, China. But in this case, America did not come in with a fight with China. The UN came in. And that was very, very critical about the Korean War, that the Soviets had no um, legal basis to come into that fight. Chiang had plans to invade the mainland. Mao had plans to invade Taiwan. We were very close at that time to a very serious, and we came several times close to very serious uh, world conflagration. And the Seventh Fleet moved in between Taiwan and uh, mainland China at that time, and you might remember how that all occurred. Yeah? They put them in there to prevent uh, the troops. No, they wouldn't have to go in. With troops, yeah, but he, eventually he did go in, and he, he went into Korea, but he wouldn't go into Taiwan. 
And it, there's still a problem with Taiwan. We still get this uh, thorn in our side. We don't know what's going to happen. And here's this uh, famous photograph of uh, the, the troops coming up to the Yalu River and uh, the look on this officer's face uh, as they approach the Yalu River. And we all know what had happened when he got up there. <coughs> uh, there's a surprise as the U.S. begins uh, the troop buildup. Uh, dear Yosef Vizaranovich, I cannot help asking you, and he wants to know what they're going to do. Stalin to Moscow, uh, to Maui requests volunteers, and Moscow is afraid that, uh, uh, that this is going to happen. He wants to step by. They really came into this thing reluctantly. And Ma, uh, Mao uh, to, uh, and you can see from these uh, notes back and forth the, the concern about the, from these two leaders. Now look at this. In 1950, Stalin orders him to get out of North Korea. He orders him out of North Korea. China is going to send in divisions. Look how close this was. And then he sends him another note, disregard the early lies, murderers are masked as medical professors. There is the last picture of Stalin. Okay, this was at the meeting just before he died. And here is the funeral. And uh, if I can, let's see, uh, let me go back to that. Let me see if I can show you. That's Malenkov. Is that showing up on your screen? Yes. That's Chu and Lai. That's Beria. How do you like the way this guy looks? It's a really menacing character. There's Bolganin. Okay. There's um, uh, Molotov. Okay. So these are the guys who go to the dinner at night, uh, the night that Stalin dies. Bolganin, Malenkov. Beria and Khrushchev. These four guys are having dinner with him the night he dies. Okay? Of course, as you might know, the Beria is dead, killed as a British spy. That's what he's, he's, he's accused of being a spy for England. He's killed in December 1953. He's executed by the, uh, his three buddies there. Okay. Uh, and by the way, the guy back here, this is McCoy, and this is an old friend of, uh, of Stalin, also was on uh, the short list to nowhere at the time of the death. Uh, Sandra and I, as I told you, had made this trip to uh, Eastern Europe two years ago, and when we were in Berlin, well, first of all, look at this picture. This is Berlin. Stalin died and in the uh, first days of March, I think about March 3rd, by the end of March, the, uh, uh, the communists were clearing this land and setting up a barrier in Berlin. And these people are waving because they can't go past this line. The Berlin Wall is going to go up where this empty space is. This is the end of March 1953. They're going to build the Berlin Wall just two weeks or so after Stalin's death. And this next picture, this is June 1953. This is only four months after Stalin's death. This is an uprising in East Berlin. So that the Soviet Empire is cracking apart almost time to the death of Stalin. The empire will is is in deep trouble. Now, as I told you, we went on a, a trip, and in Berlin, I ran across this uh, 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 pedestal. And I'll try, well, before I do that, here's the last word. This last word on this whole story comes from Trotsky. The organization of the party takes the place of the party itself. The Central Committee takes the place of the organization. And finally, the dictator takes the place of the Central Committee. 
written by Trotsky in 1903, in 14 years before the revolution, when Trotsky is still a member of the Menshevik group. The Menshevik group who, whose theory was there's no time for a revolution, Lenin's got it wrong, we have to go through a capitalist phase first. Trotsky eventually leaves the Mensheviks and becomes a Bolshevik, and which means that he takes up uh, Lenin's uh, thesis and Lenin's idea. But in 1903, he analyzes, and look at the analysis. <laughs> look how on the money it is. Finally, uh, we ran into this uh, pedestal in, uh, in Berlin. I don't know if you can read. I'll read some of it to you. This name here is Karl Liebnick. Karl Liebnick along with Rosa Luxemburg, led a revolution that was put down in 1918 by the then government, the, uh, it was actually socialists in the government of uh, Germany. And what this says is in German, I'm not a, a real German translator, but it says, died in 1916 uh, by the struggle, the Kampf, by the struggle against the imperialist war and for the freedom of all. Karl Liebknecht, who was killed in 1916 in the communist uh, uh, revolution, and as you can see, there is no statue up here. This is empty. The East German government constructed this uh, 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 pedestal with the idea of putting a statue of Karl Liebknecht on it, but their government fell down and uh, Germany was reunified. But this uh, pedestal sits there in Potsdam Platz. And Berlin is in regeneration now. And this is what Berlin looks like today. This is opposite that pedestal. Karl Liebknecht's ghost standing on top of that pedestal is looking at this. This is Sony Plaza in Potsdam Platz a thriving capitalist uh, center of activity in uh, Germany, in Berlin today, as Germany is full of life and activity. And so uh, uh, this is a, a fitting end, although I had a, uh, I had a video that I was going to bring uh, to show, which I have, but unfortunately, as you saw at the beginning of my lecture, Bob DeRosier and I couldn't get it to run, so I'm going to describe it to you, okay? Uh, this video was taken by me uh, when Sand and I visited Budapest. And in Budapest, uh, a cab driver said this to me about the communist regime. Well, he was taking us out to the place I'm just to describe to you. He said, when the communists were here, I had no freedom, but gas prices were low. Now I have freedom, and gas is expensive. And that was his, uh, his analysis of his experience. We would be taken out by him to a place outside of uh, Budapest, a place about as far away as the uh, World's Fairgrounds is to New York City. But this place was a junky area. Uh, there was a railroad station there, and power lines, and weeds growing all around. And what they had done, they had taken all the statuary from the Soviet era and brought them up to this lot, sort of empty lot. And there were zillions of statues around there, statues of Lenin, statues of Bela Kun, a, a wonderful a modernistic statue of Karl Marx and Frederick Engels, and statues of workers all with their arms in the air and going like this and going like that. And we're looking all around, I'm looking around, for a statue of Uncle Joe. And I don't see any statue of Uncle Joe. And I have this video which, which uh, pans around all the statues and my voice saying, where's Uncle Joe? And finally I say, uh, my voice says at the end of this video, and finally we found Uncle Joe. And I, I took a picture of the sky and then panned down. And what I panned down to is a plinth 20 feet high, on top of which are standing two boots, just boots. And then I found a brochure which shows a gigantic statue of Stalin. Those boots holding up a gigantic Stalin, and in another photograph of Jack Hammers knocking that statue down. And they took the remaining 
uh, boots and put them up on a plinth. And that's all that's left. And I thought that would be a good ending for our, uh, our lecture series. And that uh, we couldn't show it to you, but I just described it to you. OK, so what I'd like to do in the remaining time, uh, those of you who are there, I can see you up there I'm on my monitor, um, is take up the subject of why you think this whole thing fell apart. And I'm going to throw the floor open. Why don't we bring up the lights in 207? OK. So does anybody want to start us off? Tell me you know, one of these six reasons why you think this all fell apart. Why couldn't it keep going? Anybody? But yourself. Any ideas? Do you think they got spent by the uh, by the uh, by Reagan's program by the uh, You may have to repeat the question. All right. The the, the, the answer that uh, we have down here is that the Star Wars program and the armaments program bankrupted them, and they couldn't keep up uh, financially. Does everybody agree with that idea? Anybody? Well, it's like one idea. I don't know if it's the only one. What would you say? What would be another one? Well, the, uh, the, the people got, I think the, the citizens of the Soviet Empire got deeply dissatisfied with what they were getting. There was information about the West, and uh, I think it also had something to do with the, with the, the people obviously were in agreement to have the thing fall apart and dissolve. So I think maybe they had something to do with it. So you think that it was the people that brought it down? I don't, well, I don't think there's one cause. I'm just trying to look for... Yeah, I know. I know. I, uh, what about the idea that it's Russia? That if it hadn't been Russia, it wouldn't have happened. That somebody else could have done it. If, let's say uh, this revolution had occurred in, in France or in Germany. Because Russia is, um, uh, is so uh, backward or something oriental about it. You think there's any value in that? There were never really industrial Oh, that's the Menshevik argument. That uh, you had to go through the capitalist phase and become a capitalist country, and then you could probably have well, socialism. At least you had to be you know, yeah. Well, that was the argument that you, that argument uh, that they have to be industrialized is what um, has justified some of the African dictators. Many African countries, uh, uh, like Ghana and others, have uh, become uh, in the hands of dictators on the basis that we have to do this in order to industrialize that the Soviet model of industrialization, which uh, Stalin uh, carried out successfully, has to be done by a dictator. Does the, everybody agree with that idea? Unhappily, I think that's true. That's why one of the reasons why uh, Yugoslavia fell apart, one of the reasons why uh, Iraq fell apart without a dictator and dissenting groups you have essentially a revolution again against the administration. Yeah. In, in the Soviet Union, you had evidences all over the world of great productivity and food yeah. and stores that was stocked with everything. Why did the East Germans keep trying to go to, to West Germany? Uh, you know, over the wall, so to speak. They wanted some of that. Yeah, but the because it, it was the uh, uh, deprivation. Well, what I was thinking, I was thinking about this myself, and this is one of the things that every time I think about this thing, maybe I come up with a different idea, but this is the idea I had. When Lenin conducted the revolution, it was, and when Marx wrote the Communist Manifesto, it was workers of the world unite. But when Stalin finally uh, achieved power, it was socialism in one country. Socialism in one country had a certain um, uh, resonance with uh, Hitler's uh, program of national socialism. National socialism, which was a racist idea, but it was socialism. In other words, when you said work, uh, workers of the world united, it was an idea that everybody was in it together. But when you said 
socialism in one country, it meant everybody had to be subservient to Moscow, that you had to help Russia. And you then had Lithuanians, Latvians, um, uh, Ukrainians, and uh, Chinese, and Yugoslavs, and so on and so forth. So that nationalism was, was subverted under that program, and that they had no uh, good grip, although this Stalin had written this famous uh, uh, paper that gave him uh, some credibility, nationalism and the Marx Marxism and the national question, he wasn't able to come up with a concept that was all inclusive. And so these various national groups could not realize their characteristic and nationalism put in it, put in mind. What do you think of that idea? Family. Yeah. In for two decades, the communists could not understand why socialism didn't rear its head in other countries. And I think they kept saying they don't know, these countries don't know that they're being abused. Right, right. But well, Stanley, and, uh, look what's happening in Asia today. In both yeah. China and Vietnam, as everyone is starting to get into their own little businesses. Right. And capitalism is moving in heavily into China. And well, what do you think of this, Norman? saying okay. Norman, yeah, yeah. But Norman, what do you think of this? If capitalism is growing in China, what do you think of my idea that it's just the NEP all over again? You think I'm right? The new economic plan. So yeah, the, yeah. Could be squelched by a, a, a Chinese Stalin I, at I some point. I don't think they would squelch it as long as they control the army, as long as they control the, the power. Of the, of the leadership of the country, they're not going to squelch it. Uh, okay. The people are too happy. They have TVs. They have cell phones. I think it's a good. They'll be killing the goose that's laying the golden egg. I think another thing is the. the oh yeah, what's well, gone? There's no socialism. But you know, Sandra says you have capitalism in Russia now. There's something to be being scared of about that. Putin, Sarn is raising the fact that we have capitalism in, in Russia, but we have this Putin who has uh, characteristics of a dictator that uh, there's some concern about just where he's taking that country. The Soviets also needed the force and the fear, and that started to change. First in Poland, when the, the Russians told the Poles not to use force against solidarity, and then later, in East Germany, the East Germans wanted to use military force. And again, for the first time, unlike 68 and 53 and other times, the Soviets did not activate their the troops in squelch things. And that was a big change. And with the loss of fear and the reluctance to use force, it was just a matter of time before more cracks appeared. By liberalizing, in other words, the, uh, the, uh, the, the system cracks because you liberalize. That's why, well, my, that's what most reactionaries uh, feel about uh, any move they to don't have the fear anymore. Yeah, but they don't fear. Uh, I, should I should say that, that that comes up, that philosophy comes up in other revolutions. In the French Revolution, a similar philosophy arose uh, by liberalizing when the king will liberalize and he allowed uh, uh, parliaments or, or uh, groups to voice their, uh, their grievances, that's what caused the old regime to collapse. And uh, similarly, the best way uh, that Nicholas II could have uh, prevented the revolution in the first place was to be as repressive as possible and that he wasn't repressive enough. So uh, that philosophy does come up that the way to hold together a tyranny is to be as repressive. And in a way, uh, that's correct, because um, look at the difference between the fate of Stalin, who uh, despite, well, he died in, in a sense in the hands of his friends, but he did die in bed, so to speak, and the uh, outcome for Allende, who didn't die exactly that way, and hail the bullets in this case. Any other ideas as to why this stuff all happened? Okay. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you all very much.